We're going through the Gospel of Luke, so please uh, turn in your Bibles to the seventh chapter. Our, our passage this morning is rather short, but it's significant. Uh, close on the heels of our Lord's healing of the centurion's uh, servant, which we studied last time from Luke's, the, the first 10 verses of Luke chapter seven, comes this uh, subsequent uh, miracle as familiar to us as the first, perhaps, uh, in which Jesus brings a widow's dead son back to life. And we're going to be reading verses 11 through 17, in which Luke describes the providential intersection of a devastated, helpless widow and the omnipotent, sovereign Lord of the universe. The widow and her dead son provide the backdrop, while the compassion and power of Jesus Christ command the spotlight. And the account gives us a physical picture or a, a figure of God's wonderful plan for the ages in which the spiritually dead are made alive in Christ and rise to the joy of fellowship with Him. In the context of Luke's gospel, who alone of the four gospel writers uh, has this account, uh, it also prepares us for the verdict of John the Baptist in the section that follows and provides evidence for Jesus' answer to John's disciples. Uh, the, 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 the question is in verse 19, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? And the answer is given in verse 22, uh, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel uh, preached to them. So with this account of the widow of Nain, we see the display of the Lord Jesus' uh, power and authority even over death. And so we'll read it, beginning in verse 11. Soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, do not weep or something like stop weeping. And he came up and touched the coffin and the bearers came to a halt. Apparently, um, you read different things, but uh, it, it seems to be most believe the coffins were open uh, that they, they were like a beer, B-I-E-R, and uh, you could see the dead body as they, as they carried it. So uh, the bearers of the beer, of the coffin, uh, came to a halt, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. Uh, the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped them all. And they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. That's a, a way, that was a way of saying uh, God has come to save us. He's, he's rescued us. It's another way of saying he's, he's sent his promised one, the expected one. God has visited his people. And this report concerning him went out all over Judea and in all the surrounding district. It would not be entirely accurate to describe our Lord's activities during this period as that of an itinerant preacher, uh, but for a variety of reasons, he was on the move. Uh, the eighth chapter will begin with Luke describing how he began moving going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God with the 12 accompanying him. But chapter seven uh, began with his return to Capernaum. And now Luke 
tells us soon afterwards he went to a city called Nain. Uh, whether that soon afterwards meant a few days or a few weeks, we cannot say, but Jesus did not seem to stay in one place uh, for long. Uh, Nain was located about six miles to the southeast of Nazareth and 20 plus uh, miles from uh, Capernaum, so likely about a day's journey as, as they traveled uh, back then. So the account begins with this picture of Jesus and an entourage uh, making their way along an ancient byway toward the city of Nain when they are met by another opposite moving crowd of people walking along together for a specific purpose out of the city. You can't uh, plan these sorts of things uh, or explain them. Uh, the world calls them coincidences, but we know there are no such things as coincidences. Uh, last weekend, uh, my wife and I were out and about, it being her birthday and Mother's Day all uh, combined. And on two separate occasions last weekend, uh, once on Friday night and, and once uh, Saturday uh, during the day, I ran into two good friends that I had not seen in the longest of time, and we both uh, re re remarked uh, how you know, crazy it was <laughs> that we should see each other uh, at, at that moment. Uh, they were happy uh, meetings. Well, this particular meeting uh, would not have immediately been thought of as, as happy, uh, but there was a hidden purpose that produced a happy providence. Uh, people commonly speak of two ships passing one another in the night. Well, these two ships did not pass each other. They met. Uh, they met up with each other. William Hendrickson, whose commentary on Luke I've been reading for our study, uh, cleverly divided uh, this chapter, uh, his chapter on this event into four headings. Uh, the second, third, and fourth were the widow, Jesus, and the crowd. Uh, but the first was simply God. Uh, Jesus is entering into Nain, and the widow and, and mourners leaving and intersecting with the Lord simultaneously were to be attributed to the providence of God. Uh, both occurred naturally and without planning uh, beforehand, but their concurrence was ordained by the one who designs all things. He works all things after the counsel of his will, is how the apostle uh, puts it in Ephesians 1, 11. That's one of the most glorious statements ever put on a piece of paper. He works all things after the counsel of his will. Uh, combined with all the other things that we know <clears throat> about our God, his, his love, his goodness, justice, faithfulness, his almighty sovereign power. We are on solid ground in believing that what we have faced, you and me, uh, what we're facing now or what awaits us around the bend are all the most excellent things. Uh, he works all things together for good for those that love him. In the village of Nain, God was orchestrating the circumstances of the lives of many in order to illustrate that through the compassion and power of Jesus. But the woman, uh, the woman whom Luke introduces to us in verse 12 could hardly have been expected to have had that confidence in the moment. She was a widow, uh, which was unfortunate enough, but now also her only son had died. So what the Lord met up with was a tragedy on several levels. Uh, to be a widow in the ancient world was to be thrust into the most pitiful of conditions on top of the emotional loss of bereavement and the inevitable loneliness uh, resulting from the loss of a husband. There were scant opportunities for a woman in uh, that day and time to earn a living. 
One is reminded of the widow of uh, 1 Kings 17, whom God, with similar providence, placed in the prophet Elijah's uh, path. Uh, you remember there was severe famine in the land, and uh, she was especially helpless because of that. And so she was gathering up uh, sticks to go take the little bit of uh, flour she had left and the little bit of oil uh, remaining. And she was going to make a, a cake, make bread. Uh, so that her, haunt, her son and her could eat one last meal and, and then die. She had no other resources. And you remember the Lord would move to rescue her by the word of Elijah. The circumstances of the widow at Nain were, were, were similar, but if that wasn't pathetic enough, there was now the death of a child and indeed the death of her only son. In, in that boy, in, in him, had been the last source of protection and support. And perhaps even more importantly, uh, in him had been her only hope of perpetuating uh, the family line since the death of her husband. But now he had died. And who can measure the depth of sorrow of, at the loss of a child? Some of you I know... Uh, can. It's one of the greatest agonies one can experience, a, a, a wound with a, a scar for the memory. Does it get any worse than that? No daughter is mentioned. Perhaps there were daughters. Uh, unlike Naomi, the, the prominent uh, widow mentioned in the Bible, no daughters-in-law like faithful Ruth seemed to have been alongside her. But she did have this coterie of, of friends and supporters whom Luke mentions. A sizable crowd from the city was with her. Uh, but they would soon be gone, right? Uh, that was the woman's true plight. She would be all alone in the world, uh, brokenhearted and lonely with only the occasional visitor to remind her of the company she once had had. But given our knowledge of what follows, she's the perfect figure to prepare us for how God seeks such as these uh, to rescue. And it was this sorrowful scene that Jesus and his crowd uh, waded into. When the Lord saw her, Luke writes, he felt compassion for her and said to her, uh, do not weep. If it had been the centurion's desperate concern and impressive faith that had caught the Lord's attention before, it was an even worse sorrow that touched the heart of the Lord now. He too was a mother's son, and he could not walk into Nain and allow a mourning widow and her crowd of mourners to pass him by on the way to the burial ground, carrying uh, dead her only son. And so while etiquette would have dictated that Jesus and his disciples step aside out of respect uh, for the woman and her circumstances, uh, crystallized uh, before them by the din of the professional uh, mourners with their wailings and crying and lamenting that we're familiar with from our study of the Bible and what we've, what we've learned about the customs of, of, of the day. Uh, Jesus seems to have blocked all that out and focused instead only on the morose figure of, of the, the widow. Luke states <clears throat> that he saw her, felt compassion, for her and, and spoke to her. And there was the connection, the sorrow of the woman and the compassion of the Lord. One uh, recognized the other, but not yet the other him. Her tears, though, connected with Jesus, who the scriptures had foretold, bore our sorrows. Jesus' heart was stirred with pity. Now that's the meaning uh, behind Luke's phrase, felt compassion. It was the strongest word at his employ to describe how the Lord felt at the moment. It's the Greek word for having pity or feeling sympathy 
but it is derived from a word for the inward parts of the body or the entrails, and therefore it points to an emotion that is, is derived from a real physical stirring of a person's inner being. Thus, J.B. Phillips translated it, his heart went out to her. <coughs> Not surprisingly, a similar emotion struck Jesus uh, later when he stood before the tomb of, of, of Lazarus. Uh, he wept then, we remember, burst into a weeping. Uh, but what led to his weeping uh, then was what John described in John eleven thirty three as his being deeply moved in spirit and, and troubled. In both cases, we, we want to know exactly why. <clears throat> because in both, after all, he, he raised them back to life and he knew he was going to raise them back to, to life. But it was the whole package of human misery that is the result of sin in the world, the recognition that God's perfect design had been savagely marred by it, and, and the sudden apprehension of the personal pain sin causes and the enmity of death which seemed to overwhelm the Lord with sorrow and compassion. Now that's characteristic of God generally. Psalm 103, verse 13, we know it. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Our God is a compassionate uh, God. But God's compassion uh, was put on full display when he was clothed in flesh and burst into the human experience in the incarnation. Then he became our high priest a priest who might represent us, a real man who could represent us because he became one of us. He experienced all that we experience and, and even more. And therefore, the author of Hebrews, uh, uh, arguing there in chapter 4 for the superiority of the uh, priesthood of Jesus Christ over the Levitical priesthood of the Mosaic law could, could express the wonder of it in Hebrews 4, 15. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as us, yet without sin. There's nothing on this earth, uh, nothing in this life that we can be called to endure that the Lord Jesus Christ has not endured himself. And therefore, he's able to sympathize with us, to feel the pain together with us. We may call upon him, which is what the author of Hebrews goes on to say. We can draw near with confidence to his throne of grace and, and there find grace to help in time of, of need. Too often, uh, we look for solace and compassion in all the wrong places. What's, there's that song, looking for love in all the wrong <laughs> places. But uh, we look for solace. We look for compassion in, in, in places that won't, that won't give it to us. It, because in this life, we're besieged. Uh, every single one of us, there's nobody excluded. In this life, we are besieged by trials and setbacks, by unexpected tragedies, by afflictions, and uh, the immediate experience in those times of testing is understandably sorrow, loneliness, anxiety, or fear, uh, or all, a combination of all those feelings. And, and we understandably, again, uh, seek relief from the, the consequences of our circumstances. By the grace of God, there are often loving family and friends who come along beside us and, and seek to bring comfort and assurance. Uh, but there is only one uh, who will do it perfectly. And when those times come, well, uh, behold, he stands at the door and knocks. And when we hear his voice and, and open the door, uh, he will come in and dine with us, and, and we with him. It, it is with him 
uh, that we receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. One day he'll wipe away every uh, tear from our eyes and there will no longer be any death. Uh, there will be no longer any mourning or crying or, or pain. Until that day, uh, described so wonderfully in Revelation 21.4, we have a compassionate friend who sits at the right hand of the Almighty on high and never ceases uh, to make intercession for us. He always lives to make intercession. So it's not surprising as Jesus approached the grieving woman, he immediately sought to reassure her saying, do not uh, weep. Uh, that was counter to, to custom. Custom dictated that one join in with the weeping. At the moment, the widow of Nain could not have understood why she should not weep, but within minutes she would. So I think it's instructive now for us to note the movement in Luke's telling and to note the authority the Lord Jesus exudes. It's the movement of intent and it's the intent of unchallengeable authority. Verse 14, and he came up and touched the coffin and the hearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So note, we've noted first, uh, Jesus speaks to the woman to, to temporarily allay her grief. Then he moves toward, uh, not the woman, uh, but the source of the woman's sorrow. Next, he touches that coffin. And at that, the bearers immediately stop and finally, he speaks again, and this time uh, to the dead son. So he has first, temporarily at least, given the woman a reason for pause, but then he moves. It is love and compassion in motion. God always moves toward those he loves. God always moves toward those he loves. He moved towards Adam and Eve after they had, had sinned. He moved toward his friend uh, Abraham. You read there in Genesis. He moved toward Abraham there in Ur. He moved toward his chosen people by moving toward Moses and, and then moved toward a disobedient nation in, in the prophets. And finally, in an ultimate way, he moved toward all his elect when he sent his own son into the world. And now, that son is moving. Uh, God always initiates. He always makes the first move. Next, he touches. Uh, here, life and death meet each other, and the bearers can only cease what they're about. The commentators uh, take note that touching a corpse made one ritually unclean on the basis of some ordinances in Numbers 19, which reading, maybe you're thinking about something else, but you've read them before, uh, touching a dead body uh, or even the coffin in which he lay defiled a person. But Jesus touched the open coffin. Edersheim said he was concerned less with submission to ordinances than the conquest of what made them necessary. And then he spoke again, this time to the dead body of the son of the widow. He said, young man, I say to you, arise. Not on the basis of this or that, uh, neither did he use a formula or read out of a liturgy of some type. It was his bare word, I say to you, the word of Jesus has authority. Guess who else's word uh, has authority? God's word has authority. We quote it almost twice a month here at Believer's Chapel, Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout, etc. so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. 
It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire, without succeeding in the matter for which I send it. God's word has authority and Jesus' word has authority. Jesus is God. <clears throat> and that now becomes evident as in uh, verse 15, uh, Luke records that the dead man sat up and began to speak and Jesus gave him back to his mother. We're not told what the young man said. That would be fascinating to know what uh, he said, but his speaking was the evidence uh, that he lived. There are two other times in the Gospels in which Jesus is recorded as raising the dead to life. And Luke cites one of them in his eighth chapter when uh, Jairus, uh, the official of the synagogue, reached out for Jesus to come and heal his 12-year-old daughter. Uh, the daughter died, remember, before uh, he could arrive there, but Jesus went into the room with the dead body and immediately uh, brought her back to life with that simple uh, word, child arise. And then of course there was the incident with his good friend uh, Lazarus in John chapter 11. Uh, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days, but Jesus cried out, Lazarus, come forth. And uh, you remember, as John put it, the man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Well, those incidents we're also familiar with, uh, those incidents of res resuscitation from the dead were like this one. They were like uh, this one. It was Jesus' bare word that led to their return to life. He simply spoke the word and the miracle uh, took uh, place. At other times, with other miracles, uh, sometimes the Lord would add uh, something to it. Uh, some taking saliva uh, upon and, or, or laying his hands upon uh, the eyes of, of a blind man but never when he brought the dead to life, never when he brought the dead to life. And perhaps he wished to emphasize that he was the only source of life, no spit, no touch, no nothing, just his word. That was illustrated also in the immediate effect of his healing word. You can see in verse uh, 16, and jump ahead just a little bit, uh, that many of the onlookers upon witnessing the miracle, resolved that Jesus was a great prophet. So he must be uh, a great prophet. And no doubt this deed had reminded them of the stories of, of old about uh, Elijah, uh, the prophet, and Elisha, and how they had brought uh, the dead uh, to life. But there's a marked difference in those accounts and what the people had witnessed with Jesus. If you think about it, some of you are reading through the Bible, and I suspect you have just recently read of how Elijah raised up uh, the widow's dead uh, son, but only after, only after a bit of a struggle, uh, praying in, intensely, uh, uh, stretching himself out upon uh, the boy's a dead body, pleading with God uh, to restore him. And then there was uh, Elisha's experience in, in 2 Kings chapter 4. I read this just this, this week. Um, the Shunammite woman's, the Shunammite woman's, oh, it, you're too good, you correct me, I had the slightest slip of tongue. <laughs> <laughs> the Shunammite's Shibboleth, the Shunammite's <laughs> woman's son had died. And uh, Elisha went through several gyrations, remember, of laying upon the child and, and putting his hands on him, even placing his mouth upon the boy's, the dead boy's mouth before the Lord finally gave the boy his life again. But in Jesus' case, the resurrections were immediate. He bore deity, even in his humanity, and his word of power produced immediate results. Well, certainly Jesus knew uh, of the experiences of Elijah and Elisha. Luke tells us specifically in verse 15 that 
Jesus gave the boy back to his mother. Uh, maybe a, a throwaway thing to say, but maybe not. Uh, that was an expression of the love behind his healing act, but, but, but perhaps it was also a nod to Elijah's gesture in 1 Kings 17, 23, where Elijah is said to have taken the re resuscitated child down from that upper room and given him to his mother. And so intimate was the Lord with those scriptures. He, he may have had that in mind. He, he gave the boy back to his mother. But there are two other items of note I, I wish to consider uh, back up in verse 13. So we'll go, go back to verse 13 uh, where Luke writes, when the Lord saw her. Uh, that's the first time in the gospel that Luke refers to Jesus in the third person as the Lord. Others had called him Lord, and Luke recorded it, but this is the first time uh, he, he had not used it himself up to this uh, point. Uh, that is, Luke was writing his gospel some time after Jesus had died and been resurrected. Uh, the church was young and, and still growing, but now we see on Luke's part that there was no hesitation to describe the subject of his gospel with this designation, Lord. For Luke, it is the Lord who had walked up and seen the pitiful mourning widow. It was the Lord. And the second thing <clears throat> is that Luke indicates the Lord spoke to a dead man. And the dead man actually heard him. Well, that's a miracle, of course, but it, it's more than that. It's a picture of a greater spiritual reality in that God is able to speak spiritual life to the spiritually dead. And when he speaks a life-giving command, they hear and obey. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, Paul says, God made us alive through Christ. And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. That's life from the dead. That is life from the dead and those who experience it from the loving hand of the Son of God will never die again. This boy uh, died again. Uh, Jairus' daughter died again. Lazarus died again. But the dead in Christ will one day hear his voice again. He will raise them up, raise us up, and he will give us heavenly bodies and will give us to his Father to rejoice in the glory of his presence and live with him forever, never to die again. That's the Christian hope. But here on this day, uh, death was real. A mother's grief was overwhelming. Her future seemed dismal. And the compassionate Savior providentially came along at just the right time touched her with the power of his word and restored joy to her life. It was the miracle uh, none of them dreamed could have been possible, and they could only surmise that God was in it. And so Luke writes, the last two verses, fear gripped them all, and they began glorifying God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report concerning him went out all over Judea and in all the surrounding district. It went out. Further and further out, the wave spread all the way eventually to penetrate the walls of a prison in which John the Baptist languished with expectant hope that he might live to see his life's purpose come to pass. He was desperate to know 
And so he summoned two of his disciples to go and investigate. We'll read and study that account next. Uh, but jo what John will learn is that Jesus is the Savior, all-knowing, all-loving, compassionate, all-powerful, to come to the rescue of his people. He had prepared the way for the Messiah. And the Messiah was even then uh, working out his Father's will, uh, fulfilling all that was necessary for the completion of his royal mission, one that would end at the cross where the compassion and love of God for sinners would reach its apex in his final victory over death. And sorrow would cease forever. Now, this scene outside the village of Nain uh, testified to that. Well, let's, let's thank the Lord for that. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, recording uh, of uh, this great miracle in which uh, your only begotten son uh, rescued uh, a poor widow uh, from the grief of losing her only son. And thank you, Lord, for the, especially for the picture that you present to us here that you are able uh, to bring uh, life to, to dead people, uh, that your word uh, gives us life. And so we're here because of that. All of us, our stories are all different. Uh, uh, the, the moment that you spoke and opened our ears to hear and gave us life, spiritual life, so that we might comprehend uh, your message, your word. Um, all our stories are different, but Lord, each of us have the same testimony that you are the giver of life, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.